the untold sequel of the strange story of dr jekyll and mr hyde by francis h little this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by chuck williamson the untold sequel of the strange case of dr jekyll and mr hyde by francis h little chapter one my name is utterson linus utterson i am a lawyer in soho and have practiced law there for thirty years or more i am well known to men of my profession particularly to the honorable joseph undercoot enoch willard and other equally well-known men to whom i refer you as to my character and integrity as a professional man what follows below the facts and details in the well-known case of dr jekyll and mr hyde i have duly sworn to before reputable witnesses and therefore trust that the public will receive them in the good faith in which they are offered in view of the fact that my name has appeared in connection with the history of the case already given to the public as facts some of you may say that now in coming forward with still another statement that i am making retraction of the first account thereby declaring the first account aforesaid to be false and so accusing myself of perjury since the first account was also sworn to i deny this i go still further and declare the details as given already to the public to be absolutely correct that is they are correct in one sense and wrong in another the incidents conversation in fact all the tragic details occurred exactly as you know them the places of incident given are correct yet paradoxical as it may seem you do not know the truth we were deceived almost from the first the conclusions drawn from the circumstantial evidence before our eyes were utterly false and as such helped to augment the success of one of the cleverest the cruelest and most hellish plots ever conceived by mortal man for the benefit of those who have not followed the history of the case i will sketch it as briefly as possible as already given by the honorable mr stevenson since as i have already stated that history is absolutely correct on the face of it dr jekyll and myself were warm friends having known each other from boyhood as professional men we had many things of interest in common we differed much in disposition he had always been a bright hardy sincere fellow and he carried his happy traits into his older years i was quieter and less demonstrative nevertheless we were firm friends in my capacity of lawyer i was his legal adviser and it was to me as such that he brought the strange will that proved to be the forerunner of the dark tragedy which it is my sad task to chronicle the will was holograph as i though i took it in charge refused to lend the least assistance in the making of it as mr stevenson has said it provided not only that in case of the decease of henry jekyll m d d c l l l d f r s etc all his possessions were to pass into the hands of his friend and benefactor edward hyde but in case of dr jekyll's disappearance or unexplained absence for any period exceeding three calendar months the said edward hyde should step into said henry jekyll's shoes without further delay and free from any burden or obligation beyond the payment of a few small sums to the members of the doctor's household this document was an eyesore to me it primarily offended me as a lawyer and besides i had never seen nor heard of this hyde 
somehow i formed prejudiced opinions of him from the first which time and acquaintance only verified in vain i pleaded with jekyll to break that will in vain i warned him of its danger for it had occurred to me that possibly this man hyde who seemed to possess such strange power over poor harry jekyll might become aware of its contents or even have dictated it but my friend who unburdened his thoughts and cares to me on all other themes preserved a silence stubborn and persistent in regard to this strange acquaintance that only increased my apprehension of coming trouble of late harry jekyll did not seem the same to me while he possessed all the outward appearance as of old in many things he was changed his voice was changed and he often startled me by gestures and expressions of thought entirely unlike him and foreign to his nature i think i noticed these things soon after the deposit of the will i was much troubled and i determined to see and speak to this hyde and i succeeded it was in this way in one of my walks with a friend enfield we came opposite the door in the now celebrated gable house on the side street leading south from the square in which dr jekyll lived pointing to the door enfield told me the story of how the man whom he saw run down the child and trample on her had entered there and how that man whose name was hyde had given the child's parents a check on harry jekyll thus i found his home and thus i found hyde i haunted the side street day after day before i saw my man in the meantime i had visited dr lanyon a mutual friend of jekyll and myself to find out more of the man hyde but i learned nothing lanyon had never heard of him but at last my search was rewarded I one day came upon Hyde about to enter the door, stepping forward and touching him on the shoulder. I said, Mr. Hyde, I think. He shrank back quickly. That's my name. What do you want? Merely to gain time, I told him my name and friendship for Jekyll, and that I desired to see Dr. Jekyll. As he kept his face turned from me, I asked to see it. After some hesitation, he showed it, with a defiant look. Now I shall know you again, I said. It may be useful. Yes, he sneered. Tis well we have met, and apropos you should have my address. And he gave a number in Soho. Good God, I thought. Can he too be thinking of the will? That man was all that Enfield painted him. He was pale and dwarfish. He gave an impression of deformity without any nameable malformation. He had borne himself to me with a sort of murderous mixture of timidity and boldness, and he spoke with a husky, whispering, and somewhat broken voice. All these were points against him. But now all these together could explain the hitherto unknown disgust and loathing with which I regarded him. If ever I read Satan's signature on a face, it was on that man's. How it haunted me! Where had I seen it before? Foreseen I certainly had. There was something strangely familiar about those features, but I could not place them. A year passed, in which I learned little else of Hyde, except that he enjoyed Jekyll's house as his own. Indeed, the servants had strict orders to obey him. It was from Poole, Jekyll's butler, that I heard a strange thing that troubled me as much as it puzzled me. Although Jekyll and Hyde were often about the house, no one had ever seen them there at the same time or together and that it was only when Dr. Jekyll was absent that Mr. Hyde appeared, 
although Dr. Jekyll was often seen going into Hyde's quarters. This only served to strengthen a vague, horrible suspicion that was slowly forming itself in my mind. But my thoughts were directed from it by the murder of Sir Danvers Carew, father of the beautiful girl to whom Harry Jekyll was engaged to be married. It was with feelings almost of joy that I heard of the identification of the murderer with the man Hyde, and then I was filled with dismay to find that the weapon used was a heavy stick which I myself had presented to Harry Jekyll. We searched the rooms of Hyde in vain. He had disappeared utterly and left no clue. On the afternoon after the search, I called on Dr. Jekyll. I was conducted downstairs and across the court to the building containing the doctor's laboratory. I had never been there before, and I looked about me with much curiosity. The room I entered was large and empty, dusty and deserted, but at the farther end was a pair of stairs, at the head of which was a baize-covered door. Through this I reached Chekhov's cabinet. By the fire sat Chekhov himself, looking very pale and nervous. He did not rise, and I noticed that the voice in which he greeted me sounded unlike his own, but still strangely familiar. The interview that followed is best given by Mr. Stevenson. And now, said Mr. Utterson, as soon as Poole had left them, have you heard the news? The doctor shuddered. They were crying it in the square, he said. I heard them. One word, said the lawyer. Carew was my client, but so are you, and I want to know what I am doing. You have not been mad enough to hide this fellow? Utterson, I swear to God, cried the doctor, I swear I will never set eyes on him again. I bind my honor to you that I am done with him in this world. It is all at an end. And indeed he needs no help. You don't know him as I do. He is safe, quite safe. Mark my words, he will never more be heard of. The lawyer listened gloomily. He did not like his friend's feverish manner. You seem pretty sure of him, he said and for your sake I hope you may be right. I am quite sure, replied Jekyll. I have grounds for certainty that I cannot share with anyone, but I want your advice. I have... I have received a letter, and I am at loss whether I should show it to the police. I should like to leave it in your hands, Utterson. You would judge wisely, I am sure. You fear, I suppose, it might lead to his detection? asked the lawyer. No, said the other. I cannot say I care what becomes of Hyde. I am quite done with him. I was thinking of my own character, which this hateful business has rather impugned. Let me see the letter, said Utterson. The letter was written in an odd, upright hand, and signed Edward Hyde, and it signified briefly that the writer's benefactor, Dr. Jekyll, need labor under no alarm for his safety, as he had means of escape on which he had placed a sure dependence. "'That letter is a forgery,' said I to myself at the time. Time ran on. As you know, Thousands were offered for reward. But Mr. Hyde had disappeared out of the ken of the police as though he had never existed. Much of his past was unearthed, and all of it disreputable. Tales came out of the man's cruelty, at once so callous and violent, of his vile life, and of the hatred which seemed to have surrounded his career. But of his present whereabouts? not a whisper. From the time he had left the house in Soho, on the morning of the murder, he was simply blotted out. Then came trouble from a new quarter. 
the suspicions which were aroused in me before Kairu's murder were being daily strengthened and almost verified they haunted me day and night until at last i could stand it no longer and i determined to confide in lanyon but to my astonishment and alarm he refused to hear anything concerning our old and warmest mutual friend harry jekyll he went further and declined to continue his friendship he would give no reason for his conduct but declared over and over again that he had done with poor harry jekyll forever then in the midst of my perplexity at this new turn of affairs lanyon took to his bed and in less than a fortnight he was dead the night after the funeral i opened a letter marked private for the hands of l g utterson alone and in case of his predecease to be destroyed unread so it was emphatically superscribed within there was another enclosure likewise sealed and marked on the corner as not to be opened till the death or disappearance of dr henry jekyll i could not trust my eyes yes disappearance here again as in the mad will which i had long ago returned to its author here again was the idea of a disappearance and the name henry jekyll bracketed but in the will that idea had sprung from the sinister suggestions of the man hyde it was set there for a purpose all too plain and horrible written by the hand of lanyon what should it mean there is not much more to tell as regards what is already known you all know the tale of that awful last night when after henry jekyll had disappeared for over a week the servants warned us of foul play and we forced our way into his cabinet only to find the miserable hyde who had so long escaped us there in the throes of his awful death but not a vestige of poor harry jekyll then in the midst of our fears and perplexity i opened lanyon's letter containing the remarkable account of how on that stormy midnight a few days after the murder hyde had entered his lanyon's office and by means of a drug had changed himself into henry jekyll there before the eyes of dr lanyon then came the other still more remarkable enclosure the letter from henry jekyll to dr lanyon telling of his wonderful discovery whereby he could change his looks his heart his mind his whole individuality from the general henry jekyll to the fiend hyde and thence back again to jekyll his confession of the cruelties and the murder of sir danvers carew while in the form of the fiend hyde and his despairing repentance when restored to himself the story of his change to hyde without the aid of the drug while he slept and the using of the last of that drug to restore himself to jekyll his fears that at any moment he would become the hunted murderer hyde without the means to restore himself and his last touching farewell coupled with the determination to destroy himself all of these have been told too well by mr stevenson and i will hasten on to the startling disclosures which so change the entire aspect of the mystery and lift the shadow from the memory of poor henry jekyll chapter two to say that these deeply remarkable letters ending and apparently clearing up this remarkable case did not deeply impress me would be untrue on the contrary they completely upset me I was overcome by an overwhelming realizing sense of the horror of it all. 
for a while my little world seemed completely upside down the things with which i had been familiar all my life seemed strange and changed and the most commonplace incidents became clothed with an element amounting almost to uncanniness i was haunted with a vague intangible fear like that which i experienced as a child when some unusually ghostly tale had been told i cannot begin to tell the mental suffering i underwent during those days in course of time it wore off however and i soon began to take a more sensible view of the situation i remembered my old fears and suspicions and besides i was inclined to be skeptical even in the face of the evidence of my own eyes i have always been a practical man with little or no sentiment and it now stood me in good stead i could not bring myself to believe in the conclusions which were arrived at it did not seem possible for dr jekyll or any other man to accomplish what jekyll claimed to have accomplished it was contrary to all nature it was simply defying the laws of god's universe and i could not believe in it i was filled with a fast-growing conviction that there was something more something which had escaped us and moreover that something was the key to our situation my old suspicions returned with renewed force and i determined to satisfy myself once and for all i believed that in the past of the creature hyde lay enlightenment and diligently yet secretly i set to work to find it i visited the office in soho but found an office and nothing more there were chairs a table or two and some old periodicals nothing else then i turned my attention to jekyll's home in hyde's quarters which had been closed since the death of these men for days and weeks my search was unavailing and i had about given up when finally one afternoon after i had spent most of the day in the cabinet where hyde died i entered the handsome room that was hyde's to rest i leaned carelessly against a wall near a mirror for a moment when all at once i felt a rush of cold air and turning with a nervous start i saw the mirror slowly swing inward disclosing a dark passage floored with marble slabs i was startled and it was several moments before i gained courage to take a candle and explore the passage it was like entering an ice-house and i had scarcely taken three steps before i was suddenly thrown violently forward on my face extinguishing the light and leaving me in total darkness i scrambled to my feet thoroughly frightened and rushed back into the room where i stood panting awaiting the danger i was sure would follow but none came and i picked up my courage and relighting the candle cautiously entered the passage then i discovered the cause of my fall it was simple enough one of the diamond-shaped slabs on the floor was loose i stepped upon it tipped it and consequently was instantly tripped up how i laughed at my superstitious fears of a moment before and what a hollow mocking sound the marble walls sent back stooping i was about to replace the slab when i noticed loose earth upon which was scattered bits of torn paper still fresh and white scraping away the loose dirt with my fingers i soon laid bare a piece of cloth wet and clammy and i became aware of a faint stench in less time than i can tell it i was out of the house and making my way to the home of pool jekyll's old butler quickly telling him of my discovery 
we were soon back again with a shovel and hoe. I cannot go into the details of that next hour. My worst fears were realized. There, by the pale, flickering light of the candle, the hoe and shovel laid bare before us a sight the horrible ghastliness of which will haunt me to my dying day. That night, Poole and I, in company with an undertaker, laid away to its rest in a quiet spot in the cemetery, all that remained mortal of Harry Jekyll. On the dead man's breast, I found the manuscript that follows. Confession of Edward Hyde My name is Edward Gorman Hyde. I was born in New York, 1840. I came of a good family, and am a graduate of Columbia College. My people were wealthy and influential. I had plenty of pocket money, and consequently was a wild youth. Owing to financial losses, followed shortly by the death of my parents, I was compelled to seek out my own livelihood while yet a young man. I had always had a passion for the stage, and even as a boy had displayed much talent in that direction. Naturally I drifted into the profession, and with small beginnings, in the course of a few years, I made a name for myself in character portrayal. But my old vices of the college days clung to me, and with returning prosperity, I gradually drifted into the old ruts. What with hard work and dissipation, I soon wrecked my nervous system, so much so that I could not go through my parts with the old vim. Then it was that I took the step that wrecked my life. I resorted to opium to quiet my nerves and help me with my stage work. Night after night, I infused new temporary life into my veins with the aid of the cursed drug. As time went on, I found myself taking it at frequenter intervals. And finally, if I neglected to make use of the opium less than three or four times a day, I suffered untold agonies. The end is only too evident. Gradually, my powers slipped away from me. I drifted from one stage to another, each time a little lower. My little hoard of money, saved from my brilliant days, was soon gone. Until one never-to-be-forgotten summer, I found myself without friends, money, or home. I became a miserable, wandering wreck of humanity, sometimes an object of pity, more often of kicks and contempt. Then, when it seemed that life was scarcely worth the living, and I almost longed for death, would to God it had come! Help came in the form of Dr. Jekyll. It was in this way. I had been tramping around the upper part of the state of New York. Toward the close of a hot summer day, I entered a small village not far from New York City. I solicited a supper, and then wandered about in an aimless sort of way, till long after dark I found myself near the tavern, and I determined to ask for a lodging for the night. There was a group of men on the porch, and I went around the side to the back. There was a light on the ground floor, and as I passed the open window, I thought I heard a deep groan, as of someone in pain. Stepping to the window, I looked in. There on the floor lay a man writhing in awful agony. His eyes seemed about to burst from their sockets, and his tongue swollen and purple, lolled out of his mouth, while his bloodless fingers spasmodically grasped at the carpet. 
Jumping into the room, I knelt by his side and tried to quiet him. It seemed to me that he was dying, but I was powerless to help him. I was about to leave him and go in search of help, when I noticed that he tried to reach a bottle standing near on the carpet. Failing, his eyes sought mine. I understood, and it was but the work of a moment to get the bottle and force some of its contents down his throat. The effect was instantaneous. His muscles relaxed their rigor, and his eyes closed. He lay perfectly still. I feared he was dead, but placing my hand on his heart, I found it still beating. After a while he came out of the faint, and in less than an hour he was sitting up in a chair telling me the cause of his trouble. He gave me the name Dr. Jekyll and said that he was an English doctor traveling. Before the night was over, I knew his secret, and he knew my history. He believed he had found the drug which would change a man into another being. He had come to this quiet spot to make a first trial. Then, if death resulted, no one would ever know the cause. As you know, it failed and I came upon the scene in time to save his life. He was very grateful to me for this, and finally persuaded me to go with him to London, where he said he would give me a home and cure me of my habit. The thing was tempting, and I accepted. Arriving here, I was given pleasant quarters and established as a member of the household. I soon began to mend under the doctor's care, and felt something like my old self. I regained my old strength. Dr. Jekyll insisted, for some reason unknown to me, that we should not be seen together, and for that reason I never appeared in his part of the house unless he was absent. We had many talks, however, in his cabinet or in my rooms. During one of these talks, he spoke of his great discovery, which he expected to perfect soon, and that some day I might expect to see him as somebody else. And in regard to this change, he said he had left a will with one Utterson, by which, in case of his supposed death or disappearance, his money was to go to me, and furthermore, I was to deliver it to him in his new form. As I had no faith in his hopes, I agreed to all of this, and soon forgot it. With returning strength, I began to long for my old life as an actor, and I found myself trying to imitate Dr. Jekyll as a character. I entered into it as my one amusement, and soon became so proficient that I could imitate Jekyll in manners, expression, carriage, even in voice, to perfection. I knew this, for I tried it on the servants with unexpected success. However, I allowed Dr. Jekyll to gain no knowledge of this new acquirement. About this time, a new and peculiar phase of my illness presented itself. I found that at times I was afflicted with a deep craving for opium stimulants, and at such times there was a change in my nature. I became passionate and irritable. My temper was ungovernable. Often, while on the streets, these spells came over me, and I know that I was guilty of cruel and heartless acts. It was in one of these tantrums that... I committed the worst crime a man can. For the first time since I knew him, Dr. Jekyll had taken a walk with me. We met Sir Danvers Carew, and I was introduced. The doctor being called away, I escorted Sir Danvers toward his home. We got into a warm discussion, and at the height of it, I felt one of these spells coming on. I was unable to keep my temper, and almost before I realized what I was doing, 
I had sprung upon the old man and felled him to the earth. Oh, the agony of shame and fear through which I passed when I realized it all. That night, I told Jekyll. Horrified as he was, he determined to help me. After getting me to write a short note to himself, to the effect that I had gone forever, he hid me in an old cellar under the court. There food was handed to me for about two days, but the third night it stopped, and I quietly stole out into my quarters. To reach them, it was necessary to pass through Jekyll's cabinet. As I entered the room, candle in hand, I stumbled over a body. It was Jekyll's. Glancing around, I saw papers of salts and vials on the tables, and I knew at once that Jekyll had again been trying his awful experiment. I found his heart still beating, and remembering a cabinet that had once been pointed out to me as containing the antidote of the powerful drug, I crossed to it and took out the vial. A paper there arrested my attention and I found it to be Jekyll's will. I read it. By it, he gave his property to me. Why, he had already told me, but it was only in trust. Placing the vial on the table, I seated myself next to the body. Open near me was a case of surgical instruments among which was a long, keen scalpel. Taking this from its cushion, I opened it, and advancing to the body, I knelt beside it. Just then, Jekyll gave a deep sigh, and opening his eyes, he raised himself on his elbow. Grasping him by the throat, I forced him back at the same time plunging the knife into his side. With a shriek he tore himself free, and half ran, half crawled to the door. But I was there before him. Just as he tottered against me, I ran the blade into his throat, and he fell without a cry. I buried the body beneath the passageway, and washed the floor and door free from blood. Now that the deed was done, and I had two murders on my hands instead of one, I was sorely troubled as to what to do. If I ran for it, I ran the risk of capture for the murder of Carew. If I stayed here, as soon as Jekyll was missed, they would search and find me. The case seemed desperate. There was only one way left. Jekyll must not be missed. It was absolutely necessary for my safety. How I thanked the whim that caused me to study him. But could I do it? That was the question. I determined upon a desperate trial. I formed a plan, whereby I appeared one night before Dr. Lanyon, a friend of Jekyll's. There I pretended to change myself by a drug to Jekyll. It was a remarkable piece of acting, to judge from its success, its effect on the horrified Lanyon. I could have hugged myself for joy. At least for a time I was safe. After his recovery from the seeming horror of it all, Lanyon wanted the history of my discovery. As I knew of none to tell him at the time, I promised to write it providing he would not make it public until after my, as Jekyll, death. He promised. And so, disguising my hand as well as I could, and imitating that of Jekyll, I wrote a most remarkable letter, which I think eventually hoodwinked Dr. Lanyon. All this was a terrible strain upon me, and without the restraining hand of Jekyll, I returned once more to the opium, 
This was two weeks ago. Since then, my change has been frightfully swift. My willpower, my strength, have deserted me in a night, as it were, just as they did years ago in America. I have lost all power to act out the miserable farce of my life. I cannot assume the upright carriage of Jekyll. I cannot keep the muscles of my face under control. God knows I have tried hard enough. With my nerves quieted with opium, I have stood before my glass and bravely, desperately, tried to assume the form of that man, but in vain. The cursed opium has done its deadly work, and I am a doomed man. It is a week now since I last appeared in the dining room as Jekyll, and at any moment my doom may come. Here, in the last lonely hours of my life, some flickering spark of the man I once was prompts me to make this slight amends to the memory of the man who was my benefactor and last friend. And although I killed him, my best friend, did I say, last friend? No, that little vial on the table is my last friend. The End End of the Untold Sequel of The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde Recorded by Chuck Williamson, 2017The New Catacomb by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The New Catacomb by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Look here, Burger, said Kennedy. I do wish that you would confide in me. The two famous students of Roman remains sat together in Kennedy's comfortable room overlooking the Corso. The night was cold, and they had both pulled up their chairs to the unsatisfactory Italian stove, which threw out a zone of stuffiness rather than of warmth. Outside, under the bright winter stars, lay the modern Rome, the long double chain of the electric lamps and brilliantly lighted cafes, the rushing carriages and the dense throng upon the footpaths. But inside, in the sumptuous chamber of the rich young English archaeologist, there was only old Rome to be seen. Cracked and time-worn friezes hung upon the walls, grey old busts of senators and soldiers, with their fighting heads and their hard, cruel faces, peered out from the corners. On the centre table, amidst a litter of inscriptions, fragments and ornaments there stood the famous reconstruction by kennedy of the baths of caracalla which excited such interest and admiration when it was exhibited in berlin amphorae hung from the ceiling and a litter of curiosities strewed the rich red turkey carpet and of them all there was not one which was not of the most unimpeachable authenticity and of the utmost rarity and value for Kennedy, though little more than thirty, had a European reputation in this particular branch of research, and was, moreover, provided with that long purse which either proves to be a fatal handicap to a student's energies, or, if his mind is still true to its purpose, gives him an enormous advantage in the race for fame. Kennedy had often been seduced by whim and pleasure from his studies, but his mind was an incisive one capable of long and concentrated efforts which ended in sharp reactions of sensuous languor. His handsome face, with its high, white forehead, its aggressive nose, and its somewhat loose and sensual mouth, was a fair index of the compromise between strength and weakness in his nature. Of a very different type was his companion, Julius Berger. 
he came of a curious blend a german father and an italian mother with the robust qualities of the north mingling strangely with the softer graces of the south blue teutonic eyes lightened his sun-browned face and above them rose a square massive forehead with a fringe of coarse yellow curls lying round it his strong firm jaw was clean-shaven and his companion had frequently remarked how much it suggested those old roman busts which peered out from the shadows in the corners of his chamber under its bluff german strength there lay always a suggestion of italian subtlety but the smile was so honest and the eyes so frank that one understood that this was only an indication of his ancestry with no actual bearing upon his character in age and in reputation he was on the same level as his english companion but his life and his work had both been far more arduous twelve years before he had come as a poor student to rome and had lived ever since upon some small endowment for research which had been awarded to him by the university of bonn painfully slowly and doggedly with extraordinary tenacity and single-mindedness he had climbed from rung to rung of the ladder of fame until now he was a member of the berlin academy and there was every reason to believe that he would shortly be promoted to the chair of the greatest of german universities but the singleness of purpose which had brought him to the same high level as the rich and brilliant englishman had caused him in everything outside their work to stand infinitely below him he had never found a pause in his studies in which to cultivate the social graces it was only when he spoke of his own subject that his face was filled with life and soul at other times he was silent and embarrassed too conscious of his own limitations in larger subjects and impatient of that small talk which is the conventional refuge of those who have no thoughts to express and yet for some years there had been an acquaintanceship which appeared to be slowly ripening into a friendship between these two very different rivals the base and origin of this lay in the fact that in their own studies each was the only one of the younger men who had knowledge and enthusiasm enough to properly appreciate the other their common interests and pursuits had brought them together and each had been attracted by the other's knowledge and then gradually something had been added to this kennedy had been amused by the frankness and simplicity of his rival while berger in turn had been fascinated by the brilliancy and vivacity which had made kennedy such a favourite in roman society i say had because just at the moment the young englishman was somewhat under a cloud a love affair the details of which had never quite come out had indicated a heartlessness and callousness upon his part which shocked many of his friends but in the bachelor circles of students and artists in which he preferred to move there is no very rigid code of honour in such matters and though a head might be shaken or a pair of shoulders shrugged over the flight of two and the return of one the general sentiment was probably one of curiosity and perhaps of envy rather than of reprobation look here burger said kennedy looking hard at the placid face of his companion i do wish that you would confide in me as he spoke he waved his hand in the direction of a rug which lay upon the floor on the rug stood a long shallow fruit basket of the light wicker work which is used in the campagna and this was heaped with a litter of objects inscribed tiles broken inscriptions cracked mosaics torn papyri rusty metal ornaments which to the uninitiated might have seemed to have come straight from a dustman's bin but which a specialist would have speedily recognized as unique of their kind the pile of odds and ends in the flat wickerwork basket supplied exactly one of those missing links of social development which are of such interest to the student it was the german who had brought them in and the Englishman's eyes were hungry as he looked at them. "'I won't interfere with your treasure trove, but I should very much like to hear about it,' he continued. 
while Berger very deliberately lit a cigar. "'It is evidently a discovery of the first importance. These inscriptions will make a sensation throughout Europe.' for every one here there are a million there said the german there are so many that a dozen savants might spend a lifetime over them and build up a reputation as solid as the castle of st angelo kennedy sat thinking with his fine forehead wrinkled and his fingers playing with his long fair moustache you have given yourself away burger he said at last your words can only apply to one thing you have discovered a new catacomb i had no doubt that you had already come to that conclusion from an examination of those objects well they certainly appeared to indicate it but your last remarks make it certain there is no place except a catacomb which could contain so vast a store of relics as you describe quite so there is no mystery about that i have discovered a new catacomb where ah that is my secret my dear kennedy suffice it that it is so situated that there is not one chance in a million of any one else coming upon it its state is different from that of any known catacomb and it has been reserved for the burial of the highest christians so that the remains and the relics are quite different from anything which has ever been seen before if i was not aware of your knowledge and of your energy my friend i would not hesitate under the pledge of secrecy to tell you everything about it but as it is i think that i must certainly prepare my own report of the matter before i expose myself to such formidable competition kennedy loved his subject with a love which was almost a mania a love which held him true to it amidst all the distractions which come to a wealthy and dissipated young man he had ambition but his ambition was secondary to his mere abstract joy and interest in everything which concerned the old life and history of the city he yearned to see this new underworld which his companion had discovered look here burger he said earnestly i assure you that you can trust me most implicitly in the matter nothing would induce me to put pen to paper about anything which i see until i have your express permission i quite understand your feeling and i think it is most natural but you have really nothing whatever to fear from me on the other hand if you don't tell me i shall make a systematic search and i shall most certainly discover it in that case of course i should make what use i liked of it since i should be under no obligation to you burger smiled thoughtfully over his cigar i have noticed friend kennedy said he that when i want information over any point you are not always so ready to supply it when did you ever ask me anything that i did not tell you you remember for example my giving you the material for your paper about the temple of the vestals ah oh, well that was not a matter of much importance if i were to question you upon some intimate thing would you give me an answer i wonder this new catacomb is a very intimate thing to me and i should certainly expect some sign of confidence in return what you are driving at i cannot imagine said the englishman but if you mean that you will answer my question about the catacomb if i answer any question which you may put to me i can assure you that i will certainly do so well then said burger leaning luxuriously back in his settee and puffing a blue tree of cigar smoke into the air tell me about your relations with miss mary saunderson kennedy sprang up in his chair and glared angrily at his impassive companion what the devil do you mean he cried what sort of a question is this you mean it as a joke but you never made a worse one no i don't mean it as a joke said burger simply i am really rather interested in the details of the matter i don't know much about the world and women and social life and that sort of thing and such an incident has the fascination of the unknown for me i know you and i know her by sight i had even spoken to her once or twice i should very much like to hear from your own lips exactly what it was which occurred between you i won't tell you a word that's all right it was only my whim to see if you would give up a secret as easily as you expected me to give up my secret of the new catacomb you wouldn't and i didn't expect you to but why should you expect otherwise of me 
there's st john's clock striking ten it is quite time that i was going home no wait a bit burger said kennedy this is really a ridiculous caprice of yours to wish to know about an old love affair which has burned out months ago you know we look upon a man who kisses and tells as the greatest coward and villain possible certainly said the german gathering up his basket of curiosities when he tells anything about a girl which is previously unknown he must be so but in this case as you must be aware it was a public matter which was the common talk of rome so that you are not really doing miss mary saunderson any injury by discussing her case with me but still i respect your scruples and so good night wait a bit burger said kennedy laying his hand upon the other's arm i am very keen upon this catacomb business and i can't let it drop quite so easily would you mind asking me something else in return something not quite so eccentric this time no no you have refused and there is an end to it said burger with his basket on his arm no doubt you are quite right not to answer and no doubt i am quite right also and so again my dear kennedy good night the englishman watched burger cross the room and he had his hand on the handle of the door before his host sprang up with the air of a man who is making the best of that which cannot be helped hold on old fellow said he i think you are behaving in a most ridiculous fashion but still if it is your condition i suppose that i must submit to it i hate saying anything about a girl but as you say it is all over rome and i don't suppose i can tell you anything which you do not know already what was it you wanted to know the german came back to the stove and laying down his basket he sank into his chair once more may i have another cigar said he thank you very much i never smoke when i work but i enjoy a chat much more when i am under the influence of tobacco now as regards this young lady with whom you have this little adventure what in the world has become of her she is at home with her own people oh really in england yes what part of england london no twickenham you must excuse my curiosity my dear kennedy and you must put it down to my ignorance of the world no doubt it is quite a simple thing to persuade a young lady to go off with you for three weeks or so and then to hand her over to her own family at what did you call the place twickenham quite so at twickenham but it is something so entirely outside my own experience that i cannot even imagine how you set about it for example if you had loved this girl your love could hardly disappear in three weeks so i presume that you could not have loved her at all but if you did not love her why should you make this great scandal which has damaged you and ruined her kennedy looked moodily into the red eye of the stove that's a logical way of looking at it certainly said he love is a big word and it represents a good many different shades of feeling i liked her and well you say you've seen her you know how charming she could look but still i am willing to admit looking back that i could never have really loved her then my dear kennedy why did you do it the adventure of the thing had a great deal to do with it what you are so fond of adventures where would the variety of life be without them it was for an adventure that i first began to pay my attentions to her i've chased a good deal of game in my time but there's no chase like that of a pretty woman there was the piquant difficulty of it also for as she was the companion of lady emily rood it was almost impossible to see her alone on the top of all the other obstacles which attracted me i learned from her own lips very early in the proceedings that she was engaged my god to whom she mentioned no names i do not think any one knows that so that made the adventure more alluring did it well it did certainly give a spice to it don't you think so i tell you that i am most ignorant about these things my dear fellow you can remember that the apple you stole from your neighbour's tree was always sweeter than that which fell from your own and then i found that she cared for me what at once oh no it took about three months of sapping and mining but at last i won her over she understood that my judicial separation from my wife 
made it impossible for me to do the right thing by her but she came all the same and we had a delightful time as long as it lasted but how about the other man kennedy shrugged his shoulders i suppose it is the survival of the fittest said he if he had been the better man she would not have deserted him let's drop the subject for i have had enough of it only one other thing how did you get rid of her in three weeks well we had both cooled down a bit you understand she absolutely refused under any circumstances to come back to face the people she had known in rome now of course rome is necessary to me and i was already pining to be back at my work so there was one obvious cause of separation then again her old father turned up at the hotel in london and there was a scene and the whole thing became so unpleasant that really though i missed her dreadfully at first i was very glad to slip out of it now i rely on you not to repeat anything of what i have said my dear kennedy i should not dream of repeating it but all that you say interests me very much for it gives me an insight into your way of looking at things which is entirely different from mine for i have seen so little of life and now you want to know about my new catacomb there's no use my trying to describe it for you would never find it by that there is only one thing and that is for me to take you there that would be splendid when would you like to come the sooner the better i am all impatience to see it well it is a beautiful night though a trifle cold suppose we start in an hour we must be very careful to keep the matter to ourselves if any one saw us hunting in couples they would suspect that there was something going on we can't be too cautious said kennedy is it far some miles not too far to walk oh no we could walk there easily we had better do so then a cabman's suspicions would be aroused if he dropped us both at some lonely spot in the dead of the night quite so i think it will be best for us to meet at the gate of the appian way at midnight i must go back to my lodgings for the matches and candles and things all right burger i think it is very kind of you to let me into this secret and i promise you that i will write nothing about it until you have published your report good-bye for the present you will find me at the gate at twelve the cold clear air was filled with the musical chimes from that city of clocks as burger wrapped in an italian overcoat with a lantern hanging from his hand walked up to the rendezvous kennedy stepped out of the shadows to meet him you are ardent in work as well as in love said the german laughing yes i have been waiting here for nearly half an hour i hope you left no clue as to where we were going not such a fool by jove i am chilled to the bone come on burger let us warm ourselves by a spurt of hard walking their footsteps sounded loud and crisp upon the rough stone paving of the disappointing road which is all that is left of the most famous highway in the world a peasant or two going home from the wine shop and a few carts of country produce coming up to rome were the only things which they met they swung along with the huge tombs looming up through the darkness upon each side of them until they had come as far as the catacombs of st callistus and saw against a rising moon the great circular bastion of cecilia metella in front of them then burger stopped with his hand to his side your legs are longer than mine and you are more accustomed to walking said he laughing i think that the place where we turn off is somewhere here yes this is it round the corner of the trattoria now it is a very narrow path so perhaps i had better go in front and you can follow he had lit his lantern and by its light they were enabled to follow a narrow and devious track which wound across the marshes of the campagna the great aqueduct of old rome lay like a monstrous caterpillar across the moonlit landscape and their road led them under one of its huge arches and past the circle of crumbling bricks which marks the old arena at last burger stopped at a solitary wooden cowhouse and he drew a key from his pocket surely your catacomb is not inside a house cried kennedy the entrance to it is that is just the safeguard which we have against any one else discovering it does the proprietor know of it not he 
he had found one or two objects which made me almost certain that his house was built on the entrance to such a place so i rented it from him and did my excavations for myself come in and shut the door behind you it was a long empty building with the mangers of cows along one wall burger put his lantern down on the ground and shaded its light in all directions save one by draping his overcoat round it it might excite remark if any one saw a light in this lonely place said he just help me to move this boarding the flooring was loose in the corner and plank by plank the two savants raised it and leaned it against the wall below there was a square aperture and a stair of old stone steps which led away down to the bowels of the earth be careful cried berger as kennedy in his impatience hurried down them it is a perfect rabbit's warren below and if you were once to lose your way there the chances would be a hundred to one against your ever coming out again wait until i bring the light how did you find your way out if it is so complicated i had some narrow escapes at first but i have gradually learned to go about there is a certain system to it but it is one which a lost man if he were in the dark could not possibly find out even now i always spin out a ball of string behind me when i am going far into the catacomb you can see for yourself that it is difficult but every one of these passages divides and subdivides a dozen times before you go a hundred yards they had descended some twenty feet from the level of the byre and they were standing now in a square chamber cut out of the soft tufa the lantern cast a flickering light bright below and dim above over the cracked brown walls in every direction were the black openings of passages which radiated from this common centre i want you to follow me closely my friend said berger do not loiter to look at anything upon the way for the place to which i will take you contains all that you can see and more it will save time for us to go there direct he led the way down one of the corridors and the englishman followed closely at his heels every now and then the passage bifurcated but berger was evidently following some secret marks of his own for he neither stopped nor hesitated everywhere along the walls packed like the berths upon an emigrant ship lay the christians of old rome the yellow light flickered over the shrivelled features of the mummies and gleamed upon rounded skulls and long white arm bones crossed over fleshless chests and everywhere as he passed kennedy looked with wistful eyes upon inscriptions funeral vessels pictures vestments utensils all laying as pious hands had placed them so many centuries ago it was apparent to him even in those hurried passing glances that this was the earliest and finest of the catacombs containing such a storehouse of roman remains as had never before come at one time under the observation of the student what would happen if the light went out he asked as they hurried onwards i have a spare candle and a box of matches in my pocket by the way kennedy have you any matches no you had better give me some oh that is all right there is no chance of our separating how far are we going it seems to me that we have walked at least a quarter of a mile more than that i think there is really no limit to the tombs at least i have never been able to find any this is a very difficult place so i think that i will use our ball of string he fastened one end of it to a projecting stone and he carried the coil in the breast of his coat paying it out as he advanced kennedy saw that it was no unnecessary precaution for the passages had become more complex and tortuous than ever with a perfect network of intersecting corridors but these all ended in one large circular hall with a square pedestal of tufa topped with a slab of marble at one end of it by jove cried kennedy in an ecstasy as berger swung his lantern over the marble it is a christian altar probably the first one in existence here is the little consecration cross cut upon the corner of it no doubt this circular space was used as a church precisely said berger if i had more time i should like to show you all the bodies which are buried in these niches upon the walls for they are the early popes and bishops of the church with their mitres their croziers and full canonicals 
Go over to that one and look at it. Kennedy went across and stared at the ghastly head which lay loosely on the shredded and mouldering mitre. This is most interesting, said he, and his voice seemed to boom against the concave vault. As far as my experience goes, it is unique. Bring the lantern over, Berger, for I want to see them all. But the German had strolled away and was standing in the middle of a yellow circle of light at the other side of the hall. "'Do you know how many wrong turnings there are between this and the stairs?' he asked. "'There are over two thousand. No doubt it is one of the means of protection which the Christians adopted. The odds are two thousand to one against a man getting out, even if he had a light. But if he were in the dark it would, of course, be far more difficult.' "'So I should think.' and the darkness is something dreadful i tried it once for an experiment let us try it again he stooped to the lantern and in an instant it was as if an invisible hand was squeezed tightly over each of kennedy's eyes never had he known what such darkness was it seemed to press upon him and to smother him it was a solid obstacle against which the body shrank from advancing he put his hands out to push it back from him. "'That will do, Berger,' said he. "'Let's have the light again.' But his companion began to laugh, and in that circular room the sound seemed to come from every side at once. "'You seem uneasy, friend Kennedy,' said he. "'Go on, man, light the candle,' said Kennedy impatiently. "'It is very strange, Kennedy, but I could not in the least tell by the sound in which direction you stand.' could you tell where i am no you seem to be on every side of me if it were not for this string which i hold in my hand i should not have a notion which way to go i dare say not strike a light man and have an end of this nonsense well kennedy there are two things which i understand that you are very fond of the one is an adventure and the other is an obstacle to surmount the adventure must be the finding of your way out of this catacomb the obstacle will be the darkness and the two thousand wrong turns which make the way a little difficult to find but you need not hurry for you have plenty of time and when you halt for a rest now and then i should like you just to think of miss mary saunderson and whether you treated her quite fairly you devil what do you mean roared kennedy he was running about in little circles and clasping at the solid blackness with both hands good-bye said the mocking voice and it was already at some distance i really do not think kennedy even by your own showing that you did the right thing by that girl there was only one little thing which you appeared not to know and i can supply it miss saunderson was engaged to a poor ungainly devil of a student and his name was julius Berger. There was a rustle somewhere, the vague sound of a foot striking a stone, and then there fell silence upon that old Christian church, a stagnant, heavy silence which closed round Kennedy and shut him in like water round a drowning man. Some two months afterwards the following paragraph made the round of the European press. One of the most interesting discoveries of recent years is that of the new catacomb in Rome, which lies some distance to the east of the well-known vaults of st calixtus the finding of this important burial place which is exceeding rich in most interesting early christian remains is due to the energy and sagacity of dr julius berger the young german specialist who is rapidly taking the first place as an authority upon ancient rome although the first to publish his discovery it appears that a less fortunate adventurer had anticipated Dr. Berger. Some months ago, Mr. Kennedy, the well-known English student, disappeared suddenly from his rooms in the Corso, and it was conjectured that his association with a recent scandal had driven him to leave Rome. It appears now that he had in reality fallen a victim to that fervid love of archaeology, which had raised him to a distinguished place among living students his body was discovered in the heart of the new catacomb and it was evident from the condition of his feet and boots that he had tramped for days through the tortuous corridors which made these subterranean tombs so dangerous to explorers 
the deceased gentleman had with inexplicable rashness made his way into this labyrinth without as far as can be discovered taking with him either candles or matches so that his sad fate was the natural result of his own temerity what makes the matter more painful is that dr julius berger was an intimate friend of the deceased his joy at the extraordinary find which he has been so fortunate as to make has been greatly marred by the terrible fate of his comrade and fellow worker End of the New Catacomb by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Goblin's Collection by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. The Goblin's Collection by Algernon Blackwood Dutton accepted the invitation for the feeble reason that he was not quick enough at the moment to find a graceful excuse. He had none of that facile brilliance which is so useful at weekend parties. He was a big, shy, awkward man. Moreover, he disliked these great houses. They swallowed him. The solemn, formidable butlers oppressed him. He left on Sunday night, when possible. This time, arriving with an hour to dress, he went upstairs to an enormous room, so full of precious things that he felt like an insignificant item in a museum corridor. He smiled disconsolately as the underling who brought up his bag began to fumble with the lock, but instead of the sepulchral utterance he dreaded, a delicious human voice with an unmistakable brogue proceeded from the stooping figure. It was positively comforting. It will be locked, sir, but maybe you have the key. And they bent together over the disreputable kit bag, looking like a pair of ants knitting antenna on the floor of some great cave. The giant four poster watched them contemptuously. Mahogany cupboards wore an air of grave surprise. The gaping, open fireplace alone could have swallowed all his easels, almost, indeed, his little studio. This human Irish presence was distinctly consoling. Some extra hand or other, thought Dutton, probably. He talked a little with the lad, then, lighting a cigarette, he watched him put the clothes away in the capacious cupboards, noticing in particular how neat and careful he was with the little things. Nail scissors, silver stud box, metal shoe horn, and safety razor. Even the bright cigar cutter and pencil sharpener collected loose from the bottom of the bag. All these he placed in a row upon the dressing table with the glass top, and seemed never to have done with it. He kept coming back to rearrange and put a final touch, lingering over them absurdly. Dutton watched him with amusement, then surprise, finally with exasperation. Would he never go? Thank you, he said at last. That will do. I'll dress now. What time is dinner? The lad told him, but still lingered, evidently anxious to say more. "'Everything's out, I think,' repeated Dutton impatiently. "'All the loose things, I mean.' The face at once turned eagerly. "'What mischievous Irish eyes he had, to be sure. "'I've put them all together in a row, sir, "'so that you'll not be missing anything at all,' was the quick reply as he pointed to the ridiculous collection of little articles, and even darted back to finger them again. He counted them one by one. And then, suddenly, he added, with a touch of personal interest that was not familiarity, "'It's so easy, you see, sir, to lose them small bright things in this great room.' And he was gone. Smiling a little to himself, Dutton began to dress, wondering how the lad had left the impression that his words meant more than they said. He almost wished he had encouraged him to talk. "'The small bright things in this great room?' What an admirable description! Almost a criticism! He felt like a prisoner of state in the tower. He stared about him into the alcoves, recesses, deep embrasured windows. The tapestries and huge curtains oppressed him. 
Next he fell to wondering who the other guests would be, whom he would take in to dinner, how early he could make an excuse and slip off to bed. Then midway in these desultory thoughts became suddenly aware of a curiously sharp impression that he was being watched. Somebody, quite close, was looking at him. He dismissed the fancy as soon as it was born, putting it down to the size and mystery of the old world chamber. But in spite of himself, the idea persisted teasingly, and several times he caught himself turning nervously to look over his shoulder. It was not a ghostly feeling. His nature was not accessible to ghostly things. The strange idea lodged securely in his brain was traceable, he thought, to something the Irish lad had said grew out, rather, of what he left unsaid. He idly allowed his imagination to encourage it. Someone, friendly but curious, with inquisitive peeping eyes, was watching him. Someone, very tiny, was hiding in the enormous room. He laughed about it, but he felt different. A certain big protective feeling came over him that he must go gently, lest he tread on some diminutive living thing that was soft as a kitten and elusive as a baby mouse. Once indeed out of the corner of his eye he fancied he saw a little thing with wings go fluttering past the great purple curtains at the other end. It was by a window, a bird or something outside, he told himself with a laugh, yet moved thenceforth more often than not on tiptoe. This cost him a certain effort. His proportions were elephantine. He felt a more friendly interest now in the stately, imposing chamber. The dressing gong brought him back to reality and stopped the flow of his imagining. He shaved and laboriously went on dressing then. He was slow and leisurely in his movements, like many big men, very orderly too, but when he was ready to put in his collar stud, it was nowhere to be found. It was a worthless bit of brass, but most important, he had only one. Five minutes ago it had been standing outside the ring of his collar on the marble slab. He had carefully placed it there. Now it had disappeared and left no trail. He grew warm and untidy in the search. It was something of a business for Dutton to go on all fours. Malicious little beast, he grunted, rising from his knees, his hand sore where he had scraped it beneath the cupboard. His trouser crease was ruined, his hair was tumbled, he knew too well the elusive activity of similar small objects. It will turn up again, he tried to laugh, if I pay it no attention. Mal, he abruptly changed the adjective, as though he had nearly said a dangerous thing. Naughty little imp, he went on dressing, leaving the collar to the last. He fastened the cigar cutter to his chain, but the nail scissors he noticed now had also gone. Odd, he reflected, very odd. He looked at the place where they had been a few minutes ago. Odd, he repeated, and finally in desperation he rang the bell. The heavy curtain swung inwards as he said, Come in, in answer to the knock, and the Irish boy, with a merry dancing eyes, stood in the room. He glanced half nervously, half expectantly about him. It'll be something ye have lost, sir, he said at once, as though he knew. I rang, said Dutton, resenting it a little, to ask you if you could get me a collar stud for this evening. Anything will do. He did not say he had lost his own. Someone, he felt, who was listening, would chuckle and be pleased. It was an absurd position. And will it be a stud like this, sir, that ye's wanting? asked the boy, picking up the lost object from inside the collar on the marble slab. "'Like that, yes,' stammered the other, utterly amazed. He had overlooked it, of course, yet it was in the identical place where he had left it. He had felt mortified and foolish. It was so obvious that the boy grasped the situation. More had expected it. It was as if the stud had been taken and replaced deliberately. Thank you, he added, turning away to hide his face as the lad backed out with a grin, he imagined though he did not see it. Almost immediately, it seemed, then he was back again, holding out a little cardboard box containing an assortment of ugly bone studs. 
Dutton felt as if the whole thing had been prepared beforehand. How foolish it was! Yet behind it lay something real and true, and utterly incredible. They won't get taken, sir, he heard the lad say from the doorway. They're not nearly bright enough. The other decided not to hear. Thanks, he said curtly. They'll do nicely. There was a pause, but the boy did not go. Taking a deep breath, he said very quickly, as though greatly daring, It's only the bright and little lovely things he takes, sir, if you please. He takes them for his collection, and there's no stopping him at all. It came out with a rush, and Dutton hearing it, let the human thing rise up in him. He turned and smiled. Oh, he takes these things for his collection, does he? he asked more gently. The boy looked dreadfully shamefaced, confession hanging on his lips. The little bright and lovely things, sir, yes, I've done me best, but there's things he can't resist at all. The bone ones is safe, though. He won't look at them. I suppose he followed you across from Ireland, eh? the other inquired. The lad hung his head. I told Father Madden, he said in a lower voice, but it's not the least bit of good in the world. He looked as though he had been convicted of stealing and feared to lose his place. Suddenly, lifting his blue eyes, he added, "'But if you take no notice at all, he generally puts everything back in its place again. He only borrows them, just for a little bit of time. Pretend you're not wanting them at all, sir, and back they'll come presently again, brighter than before, maybe.' "'I see,' answered Dutton slowly. "'All right, then,' he dismissed him. "'And I won't say a word downstairs. You needn't be afraid.' as the lad looked his gratitude and vanished like a flash, leaving the other with a queer and eerie feeling, staring at the ugly bone studs. He finished dressing hurriedly and went downstairs. He went on tiptoe out of the great room, moving delicately and with care, lest he might tread on something very soft and tiny, almost wounded like a butterfly with a broken wing. And from the corners he felt positive. Something watched him go. The ordeal of dinner passed off well enough. The rather heavy evening, too. He found the opportunity to slip off early to bed. The nail scissors were in their place again. He read till midnight. Nothing happened. His hostess had told him the history of his room, inquiring kindly after his comfort. Some people feel rather lost in it, she said. I hope you found all you want and tempted by your choice of words, the lost and found. He nearly told the story of the Irish lad whose goblin had followed him across the sea, and borrowed little bright and lovely things for his collection, but he kept his word. He told nothing. She would only have stared, for one thing. For another, he was bored, and therefore uncommunicative. He smiled inwardly. All that this giant mansion could produce for his comfort and amusement were ugly bone studs, a thieving goblin, and a vast bedroom where dead royalty had slept. Next day, at intervals, when changing for tennis or back again for lunch, the borrowing continued. The little things he needed at the moment had disappeared. They turned up later. To ignore their disappearance was the recipe for their recovery invariable too just where he had seen them last there was the lost object shining in his face propped impishly on its end just ready to fall upon the carpet and ever with a quizzical malicious air of innocence that was truly goblin his collar stud was the favorite next came the scissors and the silver pencil sharpener trains and motors combined to keep him sunday night but he arranged to leave on Monday before the other guests were up, and so he got early to bed. He meant to watch. There was a merry, jolly feeling in him that he had established quasi-friendly relations with the little borrower. He might even see an object go, catch it in the act of disappearing. He arranged the bright objects in a row upon the glass-top dressing-table opposite the bed, and while reading, kept an eye slyly on the array of tempting bait. But nothing happened. It's the wrong way, he realized suddenly. 
What a blunderer I am! He turned the light out then. Drowsiness crept over him. Next day, of course, he told himself it was a dream. The night was very still, and through the latticed windows stole faintly the summer moonlight. Outside the foliage rustled a little in the wind. A nightjar called from the fields, and a secret furry owl made answer from the copse beyond. The body of the chamber lay in thick darkness, but a slanting ray of moonlight caught the dressing table and shone temptingly upon the silver objects. It's like setting a night line, was the last definite thought he remembered, when the laughter that followed stopped suddenly, and his nerves gave a jerk that turned him keenly alert. From the enormous open fireplace, gaping in darkness at the end of the room, issued a thread of delicate sound that was softer than a feather. A tiny flurry of excitement, furtive, tentative, passed shivering across the air. An exquisite, dainty flutter stirred the night, and through the heavy human brain upon the great four-poster fled this picture, as from very far away, picked out in black and silver, of a wee knight-errant crossing the frontiers of fairyland, high mischief in his tiny beating heart. Pricking along over the big, thick carpet, he came towards the bed, towards the dressing-table, intent upon bold plunder. Dutton lay motionless as a stone, and watched and listened. The blood in his ears smothered the sound a little, but he never lost it altogether. The flicking of a mouse's tail or whiskers could hardly have been more gentle than this sound, more wary, circumspect, discreet, certainly not half so artful. Yet the human being in the bed, so heavily breathing, heard it well. Closer it came, and closer. Oh, so elegant and tender, this bold attack of a wee adventurer from another world. It shot swiftly past the bed, with a little flutter, delicious, almost musical, it rose in the air before his very face and entered the pool of moonlight on the dressing-table. Something blurred it then. The human sight grew troubled and confused a moment. A mingling of moonlight with the reflections from the mirror, slab of glass and shining objects obscured clear vision somehow. For a second Dutton lost the proper focus. There was a tiny rattle and a tiny click. He saw that the pencil sharpener stood balanced on the table's very edge. It was in the act of vanishing. But for his stupid blunder, then, he might have witnessed more. He simply could not restrain himself, it seems. He sprang, and at the same instant the silver object fell upon the carpet. Of course his elephantine leap made the entire table shake, but anyhow he was not quick enough. He saw the reflection of a slim and tiny hand slide down into the mirrored depths of the reflecting sheet of glass, deep, deep down, and swift as a flash of light. This he thinks he saw, though the light, he admits, was oddly confusing in that moment of violent and clumsy movement. One thing at any rate was beyond all question. The pencil sharpener had disappeared. He turned the light up. He searched for a dozen minutes, then gave it up in despair and went back to bed. Next morning he searched again, but having overslept himself, he did not search as thoroughly as he might have done. For halfway through the tiresome operation, the Irish lad came in to take his bag for the train. "'Will it be something you've lost, sir?' he asked gravely. "'Oh, it's all right,' Dutton answered from the floor. "'You can take the bag and my overcoat.' and in town that day he bought another pencil sharpener and hung it on his chain. End of The Goblin's Collection by Algernon Blackwood Dagon by H. P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frank Espyot. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since tonight I shall be no more. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, 
and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German sea raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation, so that our vessel was made legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. So liberal indeed was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shore of some habitable land but neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon heaving vastness of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. When at last I awaked, it was to discover myself half-sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished, for there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save the vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me, that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, straining my ears as I might nor were there any sea-fowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness, and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I encamped, and on the following day still traveled towards the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. By the fourth evening I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it appeared from a distance, an intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere in the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain. I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again, 
and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror for me, but I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon, whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illuminate. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on a gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose sleepily about a hundred yards ahead of me an object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself, but I was conscious of a distinct impression that its color and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express, for despite its enormous magnitude and its positions in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound plainly visible across the intervening water on the account of their enormous size were an array of bas-reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of Doré. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men, though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or Bulwer, they were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seemed to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background, for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale representing as but little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing while the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then I suddenly saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, polyphemus-like, and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, 
the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal, and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm some time after I reached the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital, brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat mid-ocean. In my delirium, I had said much, but found that my words had given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing, nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist, and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legends of Dagon, the fish god. But soon, perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease, and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow man. Often I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm, a mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man-of-war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideous vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. Of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. The end is near, I hear the noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. God, that hand, the window, the window! End of Dagon by H. P. Lovecraft Recording by Frank Espiat